Hello, Jane Garvey. Hello, Julia. I am thrilled that you're here. And everybody kind of knows who you are, but you were a BBC radio presenter at Women's Hour for 13 years. Before that, you were the first voice on BBC Radio 5 Live mm -hmm. in 1994. Four. Yes. Yeah. I was very young. I was 29. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now you're on Times Radio and, I mean, Women's Hour is, is an enormous kind of institution, but I guess the thing that I really find out who you are was fortunately with Fee and Jane that is now off air with Jane and Fee. Some subtle changes there. Yeah. What was that about? The well, that was contractual, Julia. So obviously leaving the BBC is a, it's a huge wrench. It's quite an emotional thing to do, weirdly, because it, ultimately it's just leaving a job uh, and they don't always make it easy for you. Anyway, one of the things the Times wanted us to do is to, and the BBC, we needed to establish a difference. So we changed the name of the podcast, but it hasn't really changed that much. And, <laughs> and, and now we're Jane and Fee and not Fee and Jane. Yes. I don't think it really matters. No. So she always gets the better of me. It doesn't matter whether she comes first or second. <laughs> oh, <dear. clears throat> I really want to get into your relationship with her. But first, the question I ask everyone, I don't know whether you know this, is w I'd love to know a challenge you are facing or have faced. A challenge? I, I think being a single parent is probably the biggest challenge I've ever faced. And I, I should say at this point that I've had like everybody, not entirely an incident-free life, but a life free of most major difficulties. So uh, my parents are still alive, for example. I haven't been... And they were loving, warm... Yes, we, we did. My mum is 90. Wow. Uh, my dad is 91. Oh, <laughs> and um, and uh, funnily enough, I had a, a really lovely afternoon with them just last Saturday. I visit sort of every other week because they, they still live in mm. Liverpool, where I'm from. And we just had a very quiet Saturday afternoon together. I sort of bung together a lunch and we had a drink. And then we just spent the afternoon talking actually about the very first place where I remember living, uh, growing up in Liverpool. And we talked about all the people who lived in that street. How and we tried, we all tried to remember a different person and their various eccentricities. And that was a really lovely couple of hours. And I do not take that for granted. Because I'm 60, so to be able to spend a couple of hours with your mum and dad talking about things that happened in the 1960s and 70s. Compass mentis. Uh, and of course that too, I'm so they are fortunate, I am fortunate. I've done a lot of interviews over the years about the challenges of caring for the elderly and dementia and I'm very aware of my good fortune there. And I try to occasionally to make them aware of their good fortune. It doesn't always go tremendously well. <laughs> and, I, and I probably shouldn't even think this, but I was thinking, gosh, I wish you'd recorded it because you'd go back well, and listen to it again and again, but you probably don't even want do to. Do you know that's something I've thought about? And I have recorded them, uh, and but not on that occasion. No. I actually recorded the hubbub on Christmas Day, I think the year before last. That's lovely. And I, But I've never listened to it, but I know it's there. And... Gosh, that's. I wonder whether I ever will listen to it. You probably will at some yes. point. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's so easy to do now with a smartphone. Just get it out and press that yeah, red button. Press the button. Yeah. Should we talk about being a single parent? Because actually, on this podcast, we haven't talked about it as much. But in my therapy room, it mm. is one of the things that is very, very common that people bring as a challenge. Yes. Um, what do, I, I'm. It, but by the way, I need to acknowledge it's very. It's much harder to do if you don't have resources, financial or otherwise. So money has never been a problem. So I need to own that right from the start. I've also always, again, very fortunately, been in good health. Um, I'm quite robust physically. You're just, going to be like your parents. You're literally going to be 110 I when you die. I will still be doing a podcast with Fee <laughs> on my 100th birthday. And she'll only be 95. <laughs> <laughs> so you can look down on her. <laughs> well, I'm a tiny bit taller than. Her. Uh, so actually, wouldn't that be wonderful though if we did do that? Wouldn't that be? I think it might it might strain our collective sinew a little bit, but we'll see. We could keep going. I'd be 105, um, so I want to come and watch. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll invite you. I'll make sure make a note of that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, if you have 
those advantages, it's a little easier, but by, by God, it's still tough. And I think it's that feeling of, the feeling I had actually when I first became a, a mother, a parent, was just this load lands on you. Almost in that nanosecond after the child is, I had a elective cesarean and they're put on your chair, you know, and you just think, yes, you're overwhelmed. Yes, it's wonderful. You lock eyes and you think this is a magical blah, blah, blah. And then so quickly you just think, shit. <laughs> How do I do this? <laughs> Where's my mum? What am I going to do now? Uh, and I think there can't be a woman in the world who can't relate to that that first night, particularly if you're still in hospital. And I, I was for five nights. And um, You'd be lucky to be five hours now. It, well, that's probably true, actually. Um, but when my husband at the time left, and of course he was going to the pub, and I just remember thinking, he, I oh, you've got no idea, you lucky sod. And of course he had every reason to celebrate. Um, and I don't begrudge him it, but oh my goodness. It's a very different... It, it, it really <laughs> is. And during the time, so I got divorced when the kids were very young, nine and six. So we have been a, a threesome, if you like, as a unit ever since really. And it's, it's worked as well as well as it could do, but we have been, they've never been seriously ill. I've never been seriously ill. We've never had money problems. So it's, but it's still hard because the buck does stop with you. And sometimes you just need the immediacy of a co-parent to share. Not always the bad things with, by the way, sometimes the really good stuff. Yeah. Because they'll achieve something that, and it's just worth celebrating together because you are the only two people who love them that who, much, who really love them that much and care that much. Um, but that isn't to say that he's, he's not been absent at all. I should make it clear that he's, He's a very good and devoted father, but he he just he wasn't in the immediate space when there were things that we probably could have usefully discussed and or celebrated. But um, when our youngest daughter graduated uh, a couple of months ago, we had a really lovely day. And you know, the four the, of you, yeah. We well, actually, my elder daughter couldn't go, but mm. yeah, the three of us were certainly there, and uh, we were there at our elder child's graduation too. And we, we so that to be able to do that is hugely important. But I feel for those parents who have divorced or separated for whom that it just wouldn't be possible. For a I mean, reason. I can hear you really wanting to hold both, you know, the things that are fortunate that you don't take for granted. Yeah, yeah. And they do really matter. Yes, you know, yeah. Having money worries as a single parent, there's a very good charity, Gingerbread Charity, that yeah. supports them. And it's unbelievably stressful. Mm. But I would love to kind of go into the the emotional load, the psychological load of single parenting in the sense that it, when you were talking to me, I had this memory myself, and I'm not a single parent, but this feeling of just weight that you're kind of carrying. And it's a sense of responsibility plus the practical, like you can't do everything. There always has to be something that, that goes. Gives. yeah, And something that somehow you feel, I don't know if it's failing or not getting right or... I don't know whether, I would say the hardest times were those. In fact, I did an event with Gingerbread, actually. It must you? be five or six years ago, about those those nights where you just need cowpole, but you don't have any. And you, you can't, can't, go, you oh can't go out. Uh, you which, can't say you hold. Yeah, you hold Tallulah while I go. And I do remember a few of that. And incidentally, after that particular episode, I went out and I, I bought almost an entire... <laughs> Um, I've probably still got some. <laughs> Can't say if anybody needs any. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a bit like during COVID when I, I really was one of the bog roll bandits. I just kept going out for loo roll uh, again. You know that was a single parent experience. Like, what will we do if we run out of loo roll? Um, but it is an emotional load. I mean, actually, by the way, I'd love to hear the perspective of a, a single parent who is a single parent but doesn't live with their children because that must be emotionally challenging too when you are close to them and you want to be involved, but you're not the resident parent. So that must be strange. And I don't know what that's like. Um, but it is. It's the without... presence of absence. Though, yes. Isn't it? I mean, I imagine that's that's has its own challenge. So that particular night was just very cold. And I do remember thinking, I um, oh, this is, I'm useless. I can't, I can't do this. And I think it's those moments where you would, you would give anything for the presence of a Another pair of hands. Of another, another adult, yeah, who could also tell you that that raging temperature probably isn't something that you need to be desperately concerned about. But And the other thing, because I hear it again in my therapy room, 
is often, and this may not be true of you, is other people's high days and holidays are quite tough. Like already I'm hearing, what are we going to do for Christmas? Mm. Um, but I often hear like Sundays can be hard, can be yeah. so hard when you're on your own. You have mm. to think of something to do. The day feels so long. You can start so early yeah. and you're, you haven't got someone, as you said, just to be there with and either moan to or they can do it while you go and do something else. Yes, I, I do think um, Christmas, we were always very, very good about that, actually. And we in fact celebrated it together for a long, long period. That's of time. amazing. And now um, we, we split up only because. The, the uh, grandparents are slightly more more frail, so that is just a bit complicated. But we used to have a very traditional Boxing Day where all the grandparents were together, and I would throw together bubble and squeak, and we would convene in a very sort of play a board game. And the children I know look back very fondly on those Boxing Days. Yeah. So that was good. But you know when they do they do these um, TV reality shows and sort of celebrity SAS, and I just think. The true test of anybody is, can you amuse two under fives on a wet Sunday? Um, <laughs> you know, that's torture with, without resorting to screens. I would, I would, I would watch that. If you can't do that for health and safety <laughs> reasons, obviously, um, there would be too much jeopardy. But, but I, I really want to know because as the day can start at five, five thirty-three, used to be a nightmare. And you've wake run up out time. of steam at ten. Well, you look at the clock and you think, but it can't be 20 to 9. <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've been in the morning. I've, I've been up since. I mean, I still sometimes look at the clock at about that time on a Sunday morning and just can't believe that I used to be knee deep in Playmobil. Um, and I remember hearing Nigella Lawson a couple of years ago. I think it might have been on Desert Island Discs. And she said she wasn't very good at imagination games. And I hope I'm getting this right. Uh, but she was brilliant at singing in the car and affection. And I actually thought, well, that's really, that completely, that really resonated because I thought, yeah, I can do affection. That's not a problem. That's lovely. And I can do singing in the car, but I never wanted to play in the pop-up post office. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I just didn't. We had one, um, probably bought by a, a doting relative, uh, but I was rubbish. And my former mother-in-law, who's still very much a part of my girl's life, she was, she would get up at six on a Sunday morning and they'd open a tea shop and all this sort of stuff would be going on. I'm in awe of that. And maybe I'll be better as a grandparent, but I just couldn't do it as a mother. And the, my younger daughter had a particular fetish for playing headmistresses. And I was the pupil. And I remember in desperation <laughs> saying one day, look, can I just be the headmistress? <laughs> you know, just for God's sake, just once. Uh, <laughs> And this is ridiculous. I mean, I was in my 40s by this time and I was, you know, really used to get wound up by the fact that I was always cast as the pupil who'd be naughty. <laughs> it was just, Kicked like, out of the class. And all this before eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, so it's, I don't think I covered myself in glory in those early parenting years. I was patient. I am quite patient. Well, so, that's glory. Well, sort of. I'm not, I, I don't shout. And I sort of operated with a, with a kind of low-level scouse sarcasm that, <laughs> that, that kept me sane. But And it did make other people laugh. And But now, I, of course, I get it back. I get it back in spades from my children, who obviously were listening more intently than I realised. So for <clears> people <throat> who are listening who, you know, last Sunday or this Sunday or Saturday have that, it, what allows you to stay with it, to bear it? Well, uh, from looking back now, because obviously neither of my children, they still live at home, are awake before 12 Midday. noon on, yeah. on a Sunday. So that's fine. I would say, and this is so easy to say from my perspective, every one of those turgid, boring hours, in the end, it's worth it. You've, you've banked them. You've engaged them somehow. They're alive. They're alive. They're functioning. You're functioning. They've got something in their tummy. They'll get something else later. And... They probably won't thank you for it exactly because they don't. And why would they? But you'll know you did it. And and that's, I do think this is one of the most, and you would know much more about this. The fascinating area of being a parent is that I remember my mum saying to me when I was a moody adolescent, I've known you longer than you've known yourself. And I used to think, you daft old. <laughs> uh, you know, what, what or how dare you? But of course, that is absolutely right. Yeah. 
And it's that area of their life that I will never forget and they will never remember. And it fa absolutely fascinates me. They don't remember maybe consciously the stories, but they'll remember in their body. Do they? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So I would always say that, well, that's good to know. I would always that say... The idea of secure attachment. Yes. I wanted to be a reliable parent. So when the child came out of school, they wouldn't... Worry. No, they would never... I don't want to be somebody who they would have to worry about. They would never have to worry about my mood and because I only have really one mood, and which is true, actually. And I, I don't... That's astonishing. Well, it's a bit odd, but I, I just... Maybe it's a blessing. I don't go up and I don't go down. So I don't have... You don't lose it? No, I don't. No, not really, no. And you don't have big highs? No. Like when you got your BBC Women's Hour job, you didn't go, <laughs> no. woohoo. No. No, I didn't. Perhaps I should have done. Um, isn't that odd? I didn't really. Well, I, maybe that is the definition of kind of well-being and sanity in the sense that you're very regulated, that you're very... Yes, I think I think it's a blessing. secure. Yes, I, it's interesting you mentioned that getting that job actually because I mean to many people that would have been an amazing. I mean achievement. that's um, yeah, it's but, probably the top for women apart from the today. Yeah, no, I mean if you you know you want to be regarded as a feminist and I do, then yes, getting the opportunity to do that program was astonishing. Um, but I have to say that the process, well, there wasn't a process. I just was asked if I wanted to go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and then over lunch, I was off the opportunity. And that, I don't think that would happen now. No. I think that would have to be much more open. Rigorous. And I think, it, interestingly, I think if I'd had to apply and if I'd had to beat off competition, I might have celebrated. But the fact yeah. that it was just offered over lunch. Didn't feel like you'd won something. Well, I didn't really feel like it. Well, I hadn't, had I? I hadn't competed. I'd just been offered it. I do think about that now because it's quite embarrassing, actually, and it, it shouldn't happen. And I'm fairly certain it wouldn't happen now. Mm. It's really interesting, isn't it, that the kind of balance, imbalance between something that you really fight for and then you kind of feel so deeply satisfied because you endured a lot, you worked hard, mm. and then it does feel like an achievement. And the things that fall in your lap, or they feel like they fall in yes, your lap. Yeah. And so it doesn't sound like you feel like you've got imposter syndrome, but you can't kind of fully... No. I've done lots of interviews in the past about imposter syndrome, and I don't think I've got it. No. But I would always say that I... I mean, look, I'm under no illusions. If I'd been rubbish at being a broadcaster, I'd have been sacked. And before I went into broadcasting, I was sacked from a job. In a, in, as a clerk uh, in the uh, hospital in no, Liverpool. No, 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 how dare you? No, I wasn't <laughs> sacked. I wasn't you, sacked. You said that was a great training ground It was. It, I was sacked by an advertising agency. Which one? Uh, well, I don't think... I think they're still going, so I probably won't know that. Well, a uh, small one in the regions. Uh, okay. Which makes me feel slightly better. Yeah. And <laughs> I was useless and they had every right to fire me. But, but you know... Can you just tell me what they sacked you for? In, uh, incompetence. And I, That's bad. I wouldn't say it weighed on me, but I can tell you exactly <laughs> when it happened. It was on the 5th of February... Uh, 1987 at about five past 11 in the morning. So That's like a trauma memory, can <laughs> I just say? It was. <laughs> because trauma memories are like <clears throat> imprinted, date stamped, moment stamped yes. in your memory yeah. forever that you can go back in time, five years, 10 years, 20 yeah. years, in this case, a little bit more. Mm. And you remember that moment. I, I absolutely do. And I can tell you now, because I can remember it so clearly, I could hear my heart beating and I was worried that they could hear it too. Oh. Uh, and I just remember, and I also remember the toe curling. My mum and dad, who were great at the time, they were quite long suffering um, because I'd been to university and nobody in the family had been to university. They before. had lots of hopes. So, yeah, not unnaturally. Yeah. They, they felt that this was, a, you know, a bit of a breakthrough. And I wasn't very academic and I didn't particularly enjoy my course at uni, but I got the degree uh, for what it's worth <laughs> and, <laughs> and left. And struggled a bit because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Well, I did know what I wanted to do, but I didn't think it would be able. For, I'd be able to do it. So, well, broadcasting is a very. Did odd... you know from well, a young age what you wanted oh, to do? I'm afraid I did. I did you? I had a 
little radio station in my bedroom. <gasps> But not with any equipment or anything. It was all just no, in my head. Like a soap, like a cornflakes box. Yes, and... it was called Radio Garvey, na- naturally. It even had its own frequencies. Did it? Um, That's amazing. Well, it's weird. I think, uh, but I didn't have, I mean, my mum and dad were both clerical workers and we had absolutely no link. And I was in Liverpool and I remember telling the careers teacher at my school, which was an academic and aspirational school, I should say, and a good school, which was, I think, good for me. Um, the careers woman just said, well, Jane, you, you're not going to Oxford or Cambridge, so you can rule out the BBC. And in fairness to her, she sort of was onto something. They did tend to recruit people from Oxbridge, from Oxbridge and I just wasn't academic. Um, Do you remember the moment when you were a child that you thought, or that you got the hook that I want to do this? Oh, I, I think I do. Because I... So it's a glimmer memory as it's opposed a, to a trauma memory. It's not a trauma memory, although my mum, because I've talked to her about this, she does say I was a very colicky child, I cried a lot, and she one day was just at the end of her tether and left me in the middle of a double bed listening to Jimmy Young. Aged? Aged, t- a tiny, so colicky, so, you know... Two? No, no, much younger than two. Uh, this is her memory. I remember Jimmy Young. Yeah, well, yes. I stood in for him in the end. That, Do you? Yeah, he was around so long that that colicky baby <laughs> in the end did his show oh, wow. twice. Neither neither occasion was I any good. Um, <laughs> but so she went downstairs and just left me just for 10 minutes to put a t- kettle on or something and come. And she says she thinks that I um, heard the radio and thought, right, to get my mother's attention, I'm going to be on that piece of equipment. So, I mean, it's rubbish. It doesn't make any sense. But, it's, but there's some link in it. There's some there's grain a, of truth in there it. There might be a grain of truth. And then a couple of years later, I can remember sitting on a very 1960s, 70s swirly pattern carpet and hearing the Jimmy Young show again. And he was doing his recipe with What's the Recipe Today, Jim? And it was whatever it was, egg and chips or something. Yeah. And um, the radio was always on in the house, which I loved. And I think... Yeah. It's, I always have the radio one in the house, in the house as well. Yeah, still um, now, even still with now, pots. Yeah. And... yeah, just bubbling away. Nice. And I'm never. That's never going to change. So I think then, and then I went to all the Radio One road shows as a teenager and um, listened avidly to Radio One in my teens, which children today, teenagers today, just don't. My own children don't listen to the radio, which I find really sad. That is sad. Yeah, because it's my absolute first love, really. Um, anyway, uh, yes, so I think I did always know, yeah, that that was what I wanted to do. It just How amazing seem... that your dream has come true. Well, that's why I, yes, I, I, again, how, how fortunate is that? Because who can honestly say, oh, I did what I wanted to do in the end after the trauma of being sacked by an advertising agency for incompetence. <laughs> but it was on that journey home. I remember mum and dad came to collect me because it was in the Midlands and I had to go back to live with them for a while. And we stopped at Hilton Park Services. I think it's on the M6. Motorway fans will know. Mm. And we had a cup of tea. And I remember my dad saying, you know, what do you want to do now? And I said, well, the thing is, I really, really do want to be a DJ. And he <laughs> sort of slightly ba- excellent education yeah. in his 50s, <laughs> early 50s, just said, well, you're on your own now. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. He says that didn't happen, but it did. Yeah, absolutely. You he remember that? Yeah. He wasn't saying it nastily. No, I no. think he was just saying it like, for God's despairing. sake. Despairing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It didn't seem likely that I would become a DJ, and you can't really blame the man because very few women did do um, that. And you sort were on of thing. Radio Wyvern. Yes, I was uh, at a very small, very um, short way of explaining this is that I went back home one day. I I got myself out of my sort of stupor of despair, and I went to the library, which is what you had to do in the nineteen eighties. And I got a list of radio stations and I just wrote, wrote lots of letters and about three of them wrote back, including Radio Wyvern in Worcester, offering me a job, which I was incredibly grateful for. And I worked there for a year and a half and it was great. It was absolutely fantastic. Very grateful to that tiny station, which doesn't exist anymore, sadly, but um, took a chance on someone with absolutely no experience but with a passion for the idea and of radio. But it, if you look at the link between Radio Wyvern, mm. well, listening to Jimmy Young, Radio Wyvern, Women's Hour and now The Times, 
there's two things. There's two currents that run through it all. One, it, one is the kind of energy and passion, which is fired by curiosity. Mm. When I've listened to you, it's curiosity, but it's curiosity that is rooted in a kind of deep, realistic humor so that you take the issue seriously, but you don't take yourself seriously. Well, I hope so, because that is what I, I know it's a bit of a cliche about Liverpool and a sense of humour. But, but they do. I've but, been. They really it, do. It is true. And also, you cannot, if you come from there, take yourself seriously. No one else they will allow let you, you to. <laughs> no. Um, why the hell should they? No. And um, it's, it is a place that is outward looking. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to talk about politics particularly, but in the Brexit referendum, Liverpool voted Remain because it's a place that it looks to the outside world and had actually benefited hugely from European Union membership. And um, it's just a place that it's a port. People come and go. The Irish came over. I, I'm one of them, you know, the great, 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 great granddaughter of somebody who made that trip. From the potato family. Yes, order. yeah. And it's it's a place that is funny, genuinely and intensely curious. And um, people don't hold back. You know, doing a vox pop where as a junior reporter, you'd go around asking people to comment on things. I started off at Radio Wyvern and you try and do that in Worcester and it would be very difficult to get people to give you an opinion. But I gather that if you're doing it in Liverpool... People Can't just grab stop. the microphone and they say, well, what is it you want me to talk about? You know, they're, they're not, they don't wait for the question. They just say, well, what is it? And I'll, I'll give you what I think. And, and that's the difference. And it is a place that all the cliches about it are, I know they can be annoying to other people, but they are rooted in truth. Um, and it's a place that in terms of what it's given the rest of the country, it just punches above its weight. It's quite remarkable. Um, I'm not including myself, by the way. No, 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 it does. <laughs> I was trying to find a link between that and challenges and juggling a very big job, juggling, you know, once you were on Women's Hour, Radio 5 Live, you must have had a public presence. Well, you know, not re I mean, Radio 5 Live was very much um, an impudent young pop. And Quite fun. It, fun. And the establishment. And you had a partner, didn't you? Oh, Peter Allen. Well, I've always so I've done my best work on radio with other people, Sophie, and with Peter. And your work marriages, they yeah, they are like. my work marriages, and that's not insignificant. I'm aware of that. Woman's Hour was the brand, the program was always the star, and actually, whatever a broadcaster might think, it was never about the individual presenting it. You could tweak the format slightly, and you could, in my case, I tried to make it a bit funnier and a bit more irreverent Feminist and a bit more contemporary and a bit, a bit more less contemporary. recipes well domestic yeah. yes I mean I when I was first appointed uh, I was interviewed by the Guardian inevitably and I got myself into a lot of trouble because I did say I thought the program was too middle class and had too much cooking and this was really oh my god everybody but you went for really me. bollocked I mean but it was so ridiculous because it was the classic do bear is the Pope a Catholic <laughs> um, yeah, of course, Radio 4 is middle class. Yeah. Uh, is it too middle class? Well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But um, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just one of those observations I, in retrospect, shouldn't have made. But there are two things I want to know, so we have to take them in turn. So I'll start with the first. How did you navigate your public-private life as a single mum, the work-life balance, mm. suddenly your friend's mum's at school, Heard you, you know, before they collected them from school. Well, or... Yeah, but you know what? I remember the day, um, it was 2010, just before the general election, and I'd interviewed Gordon Brown, who was then the Prime Minister, in one of his pre-elections. Just like yesterday, actually. Yeah, I, it, yes, we, a lot of us, we'd love to have Gordon back in lots of ways. Um, anyway, um, he, he was the Prime Minister and he was on Women's Hour for, I don't know, 20 minutes. It was a live interview. It's and it, it wasn't brilliant, but it was all right. You know, I did okay. I, I sound very nervous. I remember feeling terribly nervous. And I thought afterwards, wow, the whole nation's going to be talking about this. Well, of course they weren't. And I went to pick up the, the children from school that afternoon. And I was sort of vaguely expecting a bit of a hubbub in the <laughs> playground. Like, well done, Jane. You know, Jan Nobody mentioned it, Julia, because of course they didn't. Because it's just the radio. 
And the media is of enormous interest to people who work in the media. But my school friends, who I still see on a regular basis, they don't work in the media and they consume it, but it's a very small part of, of their life. And I am always very, very much brought back down to earth when I'm with my the people I've known since I was 11 who don't have a scrap of interest in I mean, I love your humility <clears throat> at the same time. When I think of Jimmy Young, Terry Wogan, you know, these kind of big uh, names, big names yeah. of radio, I feel I have a relationship with them, that I kind of knew them, I grew up with them, that are audio to my childhood. Yeah. And yeah. way through my adulthood as a parent with young children, always we listen to Radio 2 in the mm. car with children. And so you, you're you known you and you're kind of trusted. And when I listen to you, and I listened to you way before I met you, um, I felt I knew you and I wanted to meet you. Well, well, that's lovely. And I suppose as I'm both a radio presenter and a fan of radio, a passionate advocate of radio. And I, I listen to it because it can be a companion. And if I came across in a companionable way, then that's what I wanted to achieve. So I'm really pleased about that. I should say as well, of course, loads of people couldn't stand me. And get Were that. you too feminist? Too feminist, too strident, too northern, thinks she's funny, talks too much, you know, um, all of that. And that's absolutely fine. But I understand it because I listen to people who irritate me too, and it doesn't stop me listening. So I am absolutely fine with other people finding me a pain in the backside. You probably quite like it. I think that's an element of that. Because one of the things that you and I have mentioned is what is the kind of psyche or the, the psychological makeup of broadcasters? What is it about them that makes them successful broadcasters that, that also makes them a little bit... Odd. Odd. <laughs> OK, there you go. Well, I said it. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, think, I think to want to do it is odd. I think to be able to do it is also quite odd. Uh, to be able to succeed at doing it it's not necessarily odd, but suggests that you have a, a very particular skill set. That Which is? Well, what is it exactly? It's a kind of notice me, notice me, don't notice me, notice me. I think television is very different. And I mean, I was hopeless as a television presenter. The BBC tried it. I was useless. The programme I did was absolutely hilarious. Never look it up. I want to please, please just no, tell me. No, absolutely not going to name it. Okay, I'll go no, no. Google. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just, it was a very funny daytime television show, which I have written about, to be fair, in okay. a book that Fee and I wrote together. Okay. But it was a complete flop. And I think the BBC ended up showing it at two in the morning or something, which is a measure <laughs> of that. Um, but I, I didn't want television. I, although I watch it, I watch dramas. I probably watch an hour and a bit a night. I'm not a box set consumer. I won't gobble up a series. I don't really understand that. Radio, I will listen to happily all day. Podcasts, I love. So as a therapist, mm -hmm. one of my kind of takes on being a therapist is why I love my job. And I, like you, I find the job that I, the minute I started doing it, I knew this was the job I wanted to do forever. I'll never forget that moment is that I think I was giving to somebody else what I was most wanted to receive, that I most wanted to be heard, I most wanted to be given attention to, mm -hmm. I wanted to matter, I wanted warmth. And so it gave me something powerful in being able to give it to others. And then actually, of course, when you give it, it's reciprocal because you get it back. Yes, I get that. And I think... So what's your version of that? Well, I think there is an element of that in every broadcaster. It's I want to be heard. And I was from a background where I wouldn't have expected to be heard necessarily at school. So at, well, you, you weren't an only child. No, my younger sister is is perfectly voluble <laughs> <laughs> and is more than heard. Uh, and she won't be listening to this or watching it. So that's fine. No. Uh, but we're very close, I should yeah. say. And she is interested in the media, but but it doesn't work in it. Um I went to a, a primary school where I was very much, top, frankly, top of the class. I was a, clever, a clever little thing and a bit odd and a bit strange. But I was the sort of child who um, would, when children knocked on the door to play out, if I was in the middle of a book, I would just say, no, thanks. And, and so you're an introvert. A bit of an introvert. I think all 
all broadcasters are introverted, particularly radio presenters, but they're also egomaniacs. Okay. Good. So I think they're Carry both. on. Well, no, this is fertile <laughs> territory, isn't it? Yeah. And then at secondary school, I was very much bumping along at the bottom in my class, really quite gifted. Because you were at a clever school. I was at an academically selective secondary school and it was the last year of the direct grant system where they would pluck a pluck children from primary schools, state primary schools, and pay for them to go to be privately educated. Wow. And it ended that year. It was abolished by the Labour government at the time in 1975. I think this is right. People can check this. But So I, I got a private education for, for very little money. Uh, my parents made a contribution. a contribution, but it really wasn't very much. And lots of the girls I was at school with got completely free places. And... I'm still friendly with with lots of them, and there have been some pretty impressive careers from our cohort of girls who went really? to school in the 1970s in Liverpool. And many of my classmates have stayed in, on Merseyside, and they're doctors and uh, pathologists and dentists and all, really all yeah, yeah. And lawyers. And then others, some of us have also left to have careers largely in the South. Because Liverpool in the 1980s, when we all left school, was not a place where you would linger necessarily if you wanted to get on in the world. And some of us... You had to go leave. to London, really. You pretty much had to get out of Liverpool, yeah, to be... Well, the whole Norman Tebbit, get on your bike thing, was something that a lot of us did have to do. Um, but I, so I think I was very much brought down to earth at secondary school, as a lot of kids are, when you realise, oh, you're not the smarty pants you thought you were. You're actually a bit average. And I was a bit average, but I was always good at English and I had exceptional English teachers and hugely grateful to them, actually, because they did, they did, I think, spot something that I had that I might be able to make use of. And Your ability to put words together in a yes, way that is yeah. both storytelling, emotionally resonant and but, original? I suppose so, and an ability to hold an argument together, but also to bring other people along with me and not never to take it too seriously. So I did English at university and that didn't really deliver for me. I, I wish I had, I wish I'd done history, but I, I should have, my daughter has just graduated in history and I'm Good for her. really jealous of the fact that she, she's got this knowledge. She did the course that I should have done. But anyway, um, so that was a bit of a letdown, my university education, but not the university's fault, it was mine. But if we go back to my point that you're now doing what you wanted to receive, mm. it was that you wanted to be heard and you wanted to matter? Oh, absolutely that. There isn't a broadcaster in the, broadcaster in the land, in the world, who doesn't want honestly doesn't want to be noticed. <laughs> I've got, I guess everybody wants to matter, but yes... I mean, it can bite you on the bottom, of course, because if you get things wrong, then that matters. I mean, some of the idiotic things that I've got into trouble for, I remember I was slightly rude about Arctic roll on Woman's Hour. Once. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it got in the papers, Julia. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, but on other occasions, um, so I was on the radio on um, September the 11th, for example. Oh, gosh. Which was an absolutely colossal responsibility. Yeah. And my eldest daughter was 18 months old at the time. 2001. 2001. She hadn't slept the night before. Uh, she'd been, she was teething. And it was a beautiful day, very much like today, actually. It was a gorgeous autumn day. And I'd taken her to the park in the morning. And like a lot of working mothers with young children, people will relate to this. Women will, certainly. I was actually looking forward to going to work because I thought it would be restful. <gasps> and it happened to be that day. And Peter Allen, who I work with normally, was on holiday. Oh my goodness! You didn't have your I didn't have normal... my normal oppo, and he was always brilliant in in them. And we were working for Five Live, which was obviously rolling news network. And I think I I I grew up that day in a way that it's almost impossible to describe. And it must be true of every working broadcaster who was actually on that day, because you I remember the program that I was doing started at four o'clock in the afternoon. The incident in New York had happened in Washington, happened at about two. So we were a few hours in and it was just an, an unravelling of something we couldn't begin to grasp. And I I did it all right that day. And actually Fee, who I now do the podcast with, 
came on after me and did another four hours, I think, after I'd finished. And we both often, we do have that in our professional locker, if you like, as the, as the toughest day we ever spent in the office. Because to be able to keep talking, to stay calm, and to be able to convey the facts without sounding as though you were panicking. Yeah, when you were but panicking inside. When we inside. were panicking, because none of us knew... None of us knew what this meant. Um, but in your locker, in psychological terms, and this might be annoying, is is almost like post-traumatic growth, isn't it? That when you've yeah. s- survived something and done something that you thought you never could or would, mm. and you find that you did, you then recognise you have a breadth and a, a capacity to manage enormous complexity and difficulty and and trauma is it in, the, in yes. that case I think that you didn't think you had. I think so. That's anything true. is easy after that. Well, I, do you know what? I think professionally, anything would be easy. I mean, in the nicest possible way, when a recipe went wrong on Woman's Hour, <laughs> I, I did I did find it hard to care. Yeah. Uh, or, or or when an actress just wasn't very interesting, <laughs> <laughs> I I would. And they frankly, they're not all interesting. Um, <laughs> you discover why some of them have become actresses. Um, <laughs> they needed the lines. Yes, quite. Um, <laughs> and absolutely nothing. I remember going home that day, and what I did know was. I mean, heaven forbid that, that there would never be anything in my professional life that would be that tough again. It changed um, your perspective yeah, about it, what's it, difficult. Yes, it, re- it really did. Yeah, it really did. So we're coming to the end. Will you talk to me about your work wife and how... <laughs> how th- so obviously it's a long relationship. Well, it's interesting. So we were certainly at the BBC together on 9-11, for example, back in 2001, but we weren't friends because, and I think she, if he would agree with this, women back then were, you competed against each other. You were not necessarily likely to bond. She and you I. You were each other's threat. As yeah, it were. kind of. We, we You're were. Fighting for the same spot. Yes. Yeah. And I would say that my generation of women in the media have been much better at reaching out to women below us. And I have mentees who I keep in touch with and I'm, I'm really keen to do my bit there. I think it's incredibly important. important. Yeah, but really. no woman in broadcasting ever. Mentored you? No. Or made that any. That was said with a lot of feeling. Well, I just don't think it was very good. No, it wasn't very good. And they should have done, but I understand why they didn't because I think they felt threatened. and Because they I, felt on shaky ground. And they were on shaky ground. And we now know, of course, that they didn't get paid properly and all of those other things. So Fee and I were thrown together partly because the BBC, to be blunt about it, needed a podcast with two women on it because I think they looked and thought, oh, shit, we've, we've got a load of blokes talking to each other. We need something for sounds. We need some old birds that we can stick on sounds, yeah, who who won't mind just being asked to talk about anything. And so we, we did an experimental conversation. With the, and we did know each other by then, but not particularly well. And we were thrown together in a studio and we just talked to each other. And anyway, this this recording was played to the then controller of Radio 4. And it was a woman, actually, and she just went, no, no, absolutely not, no. So it, it lay on the file for a while and then they revived it. Um, Did somebody else come along? Someone else came along and thought, a woman, another woman came along and thought that as long as we were given quite a strict format and the format was that we had to promote other Radio 4 programmes in our podcast. We had to talk about them. And we did it for about three weeks, and then it turned out that the listeners couldn't stand any of the bits where we were promoting, but were very happy to just listen to us talk. Um, so it then became very successful. Yeah, in pod- hugely. I mean, podcasts was. are, I mean, they're not. we're not talking billions of listeners. But millions. But millions listeners. over the course of the time that we were doing it. That's huge. And it was something, yeah, both of us were really proud of it because you should be. it started with absolutely nothing and we were paid, I think it was 150 quid a podcast. Um, maybe it was 200, but it wasn't a great deal of money and um, it got better, thank God. But in the end, brilliantly for us, in um in our 50s we were poached and that never happens to women in their 50s you're not told somebody else wants you and they're prepared to pay you a lot more money to be blunt about it because mm. this is important stuff because in the past we hadn't been paid as well as the men and fee is she we don't agree on everything at all but she is but that's what makes it interesting yeah it? and it does and we're very different people but we also have a lot in common and that's why i am energized by her 
and I think that it you get, spark each other. Yeah, don't we you? absolutely do spark spark off each other. There's with, this with, underlying yeah, kind no, of respect and warmth, hugely. Um, but we we also can. I don't think either of us would seek the other out over the course of a weekend anymore because we've seen each other so much during the week. Yeah. But the same with what does annoy us both is that people will say to both of us, oh, do you and Jane fall out? And nobody, when I was working with Peter and I worked with him for 30 ever years, asked you. they never asked. They never asked. And we did. We would have the occasional argy-bargy. Yeah, of course, like any human um, being. Because, but, but nobody ever inquired about it. And that really... That is quite annoying that people can't accept that we are friends, but also with opinions. And not always the same. Not always yeah. the same. No. But also, it isn't about having the fight. It's repairing after the fight that you can still, yeah. you can understand each better. You you get back on, you, you yeah. do your show. Yeah, yeah. So from what you've said to me as we come to the end, I've really loved this conversation. And thank you for being no, it's, so open. It's, it's interesting. So, women, you're 60 now, yeah. I'm 65. You probably never expected to be at the kind of peak of your career at 60 with a kind of... Financially. Optimistic <laughs> future. <laughs> oh, that's true. I didn't. I thought... I said, look, if you're going to be think about it in crude listenership terms, then presenting Woman's Hour will be the, the peak of my broadcasting career. But saying the opening words on Five Live is actually my big radio anorak moment. Is it? That's so and great. I probably had, if I'm honest, more fun at Five Live than I did at Radio 4, um, which was a bit of a straight-jacketed place to work in lots of ways. Five Live was a new station. We were all young. Um, so exciting. And it was exciting. Yeah. You could make it what you wanted. Yes. And Radio 4 was very much what it already is. And it doesn't matter how but much. Do you have another dream? Uh, professionally, no, I don't. I, I absolutely love what I'm doing now. And if I can carry on doing this a little bit longer, then brilliant. But it's a fickle old world and who knows. And um, a private dream then? It's not a dream that... I wouldn't... Private dream. What would Come on, be? Jane. Okay. You um... have one. Everybody does. <laughs> I wouldn't mind a house in the country and a man is quite good at DIY. Okay, that's a good one. I'll take that. Settle for that. <laughs> yeah. um, but I d I'd never get married again. No. That definitely isn't in my locker of dreams. But it would, yeah. I'd a place to go in the country to, and someone to do nothing with and he can do the DIY. Yeah, I think they, yeah, do the DIY and... Um, Likes your jokes. And yes, isn't challenged by my jokes. Goes along with them. Yeah, I think that would that would be good. Whether that's going to happen in my... Is this my third age or have I moved into the fourth? So You're in your on, third. Based on my parents' longevity, I mean... You've got a long way to go. And I met my Lots great, of opportunities. Yeah, my great-grandma was 96. Bumble is just crying out for you. Do you think? That's what Fee tells me. But I'm not sure she's right. If I was your therapist, mm -hmm. I would say that you have to let yourself really want what you dream. Mm. And if you give yourself permission to do that, you're more likely to get it. If you think it's a wafty dream over there, yeah, it's less likely to be a reality. So are you telling me I've actually got to do something? Yes. Oh, that's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> but thank you anyway. Okay. <laughs> On that point, we will, we will end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Sophie and Emily. We are going to talk about Jane Garvey. And what a lovely conversation I had with her. Right now, I'm really relating to the bit where Jane Garvey was talking about the sort of toils of parenting and particularly she was talking about single parenting, which is not my experience. But our smoke alarm went off at 5.30am this morning and nobody went back to sleep. My daughter has a temperature and I just missed recording the first part of our podcast because I've got my diary in a muddle. And right now I'm really relating to that sort of sense of juggle and feeling like oh this is a lot to manage I really appreciated her speaking to that and speaking to the length of the days that it can really feel endless endless and like she said she has resources in terms of finances and support and I obviously am not a single parent and, and also have resources so 
for the parents out there that that don't have that i it's it it's hard it's hard whoever you are but even harder if you don't have those things the struggle through it with even less support than you have if anyone listening has been a single parent or is a single parent to really let sink in that there is so much in the structural setup of the way we now live our lives in the countries that we're in we don't parent in community and to help support your sense of self compassion so that you can be like oh yeah by sharing the frailties and our fuck ups it allows us to be like oh it's not me being a failure this is just really hard yeah and, and i hope that to take it out of the personal yeah and so i think that's one of the great things about jane and also i was a, a big fan of fortunately something a little bit surreal for me having listened to a lot of fortunately to then hear jane talking to you which felt like wires crossing in my brain but they're so mm. good at being honest and she is so good at being honest about the sort of imperfections of her and of life that kind of help us feel a bit more forgiving towards ourselves. Often when we find things hard, we think we're not doing it well because we're finding it hard. And sometimes in the context of parenting, where there's all this also myths around like the joy of parenting, which is not to say that there isn't joy in parenting, but a lot of it is slog and boredom and <laughs> all of the other mm. things that go with it. And I loved what you said, Soph, about her honesty, because I think that... There's such a, an aliveness in being truly articulate and truly honest with that sense of humour that, that feels so relatable. And oh, yes, also, I want to be your friend. Like, <laughs> and, and it made me think about today's culture and how there's so much fear around being that honest because there's so much fear about saying the wrong thing and being attacked. And I feel it sometimes on the pod when we're talking about mm. more sensitive subjects that I, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I'm worried that something I say is going to be misconstrued and it can be quite inhibiting. And I think the intention of that comes from a really good place. If we want to live in a, a kinder world, a more understanding world, but the effect of it I think can feel like maybe a slightly blander world <laughs> and a less completely honest world and sometimes a bit more in inhibited too. And I think that's why people love listening to Jane because she is just honest and, and funny. So there are some particular broadcasting voices. What about Jeremy Paxton? <laughs> He's got a very <laughs> recognisable voice. <laughs> Isn't he Paxman? Oh. <laughs> He's Paxman. <laughs> no, it's been a really long day already. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy Paxman, who I'm sure listens to our podcast. <laughs> yes, we really be Sorry, up it's his a devoted, street. devoted listener. Devoted listener. Yeah. But I think where I was going though is cadence and tone and timbre and how you use your voice. I use a lot in therapy that you can expand your relationship with someone by slowing down, by deepening your voice, by reaching to them with your tone. And I think in, with the voices of the people we've just mentioned, there's something about their voice that I just want to jump into and I feel at home with. And so I think it is them and what they say. And I love minutiae. I think you get a lot of insight from minutiae, which is why I love Fortunately too. But I don't think we talk about psychologically the impact of voice either that much. No, they have very soothing voices. Although I do remember as a child, mum, knowing that you had like a therapy voice. <laughs> <laughs> you oh, yeah. gave me such a hard we time. Gave you a hard I remember time. all that. Oh, rightly so. She's doing I... her therapy voice. <laughs> yeah, and I think you'd say, "Fuck off! Don't give me that therapy voice." Yeah. Is what you'd say because that's patronising. But also, it was when you were training, right? I think yeah. often it's a learning curve on that one. Um, yeah, I had a speech voice as well, which was even worse. <laughs> Making Projecting. speech voice, which is. Oh, God, that was so bad. It probably still is, actually. Do you think we are teasing each other in this way in relation to Jane, is that we've had this transference in the therapy room and is there a transference going on between us that we've taken on the lightness 
and irreverence that she has and we're doing it with each other. Is there a transference going on here? Maybe, but I'm very happy to have Jane Garvey's transference. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> but also I think some of the episodes we do are have a lot of painful stories in them and that is partly what's powerful and helpful about sharing them. Although Jane had shared some of her knocks and bumps and hardships, she also shared the vision of her sitting with her parents in their 90s, chatting about their old street. We really need some good stories in the world too that feel warming. comforting and warming and I guess we're also responding to that in this one, we're not having to connect to really deep pain. There is a lot of light and funny joy in her sharing and also it's a success story isn't it she had this bumpy start at school and then it came good her dream came true when you were talking to her about she's peaking in her 60s you're peaking in your 60s professionally too and I was thinking probably very rarely true of the generation before you that there were women in their 60s who were getting the opportunity to experience that level of success late in life because they just didn't have the same professional opportunities. Yeah, that's a good point. But that's a nice thing mm. to notice. It is. Just from a personal point of view, definitely feel like the older I get, the more feminist I get. Not that that's I've ever... I haven't ever felt like that I wasn't a feminist. I think Sophie and I both went to a school that really promoted feminism, actually, in a, in a very positive way or at least that was my there was lots mm -hmm. of things I didn't like about it but that part I think was genuinely I think quite progressive for the 90s mm -hmm. I, I think having children I think has made me more feminist and I think the things we carry in our body and the sort of the sort of innate inequalities in some ways of the burden of that of being pregnant or deciding to carry a child I think that has just felt much more real to me as I've got older in a way. And this is just my personal experience. I'm sure everybody's is very different, but it certainly felt much more real to me the older that I've got. Mm -hmm. And is what you're saying that as a parent, you feel you want to fight for your children's future, both son and daughter, but also the clarity with which you see the patriarchy or that there's lip service made to feminism but not act and not actuality gets under your crawl more in a way yes definitely in terms of my children but I was actually really just thinking much more just being in a female body what that means as a woman as being somebody who is the one that bears a child and therefore has ultimately at that point is the one who has carrying the burden who carries that burden yeah i was thinking about it much more bodily <laughs> okay that's interesting and from conversations with friends i think this is often a shared experience if these are friends who've had children then up to the point until you're pregnant in many ways there is a lot of equality or at least it feels that way and so it's quite a shock to suddenly your sex to be such a defining shift in how your life looks and the kind of burden and stress you carry. To take it back to Jane's interview, where she talked about the fact that when she divorced, there's possibly a different kind of burden for being a man in that situation of mm, being alone, sure. of not having contact, but it's different. And it's quite stunning to suddenly realise that the body you're in makes such a big difference to the choices that you might have or how society reacts to some of the choices you have. A client was telling me social studies have so much higher expectation for her than for her separated partner in terms of what she should be able to cope with. So interesting. Because there's an expectation mm. as a mother you could or should be able to cope. Provide or do. Provide or, or, yeah. One thing that I was thinking about is the pressure to be all things when you're a single parent, right? You have to be the one that's getting the uniform ready and remembering the school trips. But also, as she was talking about, the expectation is also to be the one that enjoys being the um, pupil and while your child is being the head teacher and being the good at playing one. And that's a huge burden to have to be all of those things and I loved what she said about her realization of okay no actually these things I'm really good at and hopefully that's enough and you know I am never going to be 
the uh, really good obedient pupil, unsurprisingly. But I think there's very helpful and reassuring, I find, pretty extensive research about this idea of being a good enough parent, which I think we talk about that Winnicott phrase, good enough parent, mm. quite loved on the podcast. And I don't know if either of you know the Ed Tronic who did yeah. all the sort of, he did all the still-faced experiments with, with uh, babies around. If you're staring at a baby for long enough and you'd have no facial expression at all, the baby will work harder and make all these faces or maybe cry or smile and do all of reaction. these things to get a reaction. And if you just maintain a completely still face, eventually they give up. So that in terms of child's development, sort of, it was really important research in the 70s. But he also wanted to do research into the reality of parenting, like the messiness of parenting. It's not done in a lab. And so he, from a research perspective, wanted to work out like how much time do you actually have to be a really good, super attuned, in sync with your child, your good attachment, yeah. yeah, to be good enough. And what he found through his research is that actually only 30% of the time do you have to be like, super attuned in sync I'm understanding what you're feeling I'm reciprocal like all of those serve and return interactions 30% of the time you can be like trying but maybe you just don't really know or you're not quite sure but you're trying to work it out and 30% of the time you can have it like really not right and that's okay in general it's that is forgiving. enough to have a, a child who has a good enough experience to have a kind of secure attachment and all the things that is related to having the positive outcomes related to having the security outcome. So I find that reassuring as a statistic, as a therapist and a parent. <laughs> yeah, that is reassuring. So I really want to thank Jane Garvey for being such a wonderful guest and giving us her time, uh, which is very precious because she works extremely hard. And I want to thank all of you for listening. Do again, please rate and review and subscribe to the podcast because it helps us build listeners and is good for us and for you. And also do sign up to our Substack newsletter, which will be at the end of the show notes so that we are giving you information and knowledge and thoughts that we can't talk about on the pod. Um, until next time, thank you.